Good morning. Welcome to the Avenue. Thank you for joining us on this Memorial Day weekend. Uh, this is a weekend as a, a country and as a community that we do remember the sacrifices of so many men and women and families uh, who have fought for our freedom and who have given their lives for our freedom. This morning as a church, we do uh, just pause and remember, and we also just uh, commit to not taking for granted the opportunity we have here. Uh, we have the opportunity each and every week to, to gather as a church uh, to worship a God who um, has set us free, a God who loves us uh, because of the sacrifice of people that we may never know. And so that's not, not something that we take lightly. It's not something that we take for granted. And so uh, once again, we're glad that you're here. You could have been anywhere this weekend. Thank you for making part of the Avenue part of uh, your Memorial Day weekend. It's going to be a great day as we continue our blessed series. It's part two. And so if you missed last week, uh, you can find it online at theavenuechurch.com or on YouTube. And so uh, check it out. If you missed last week, it's going to be a great day today, though. Thank you for being here. Why don't you stand up, tell somebody hello, and we'll sing a few songs together. Began to open, and the blindness leaves the light. If you have sources, I see the world in light. I see the world in white. I see the world in light. Rest in living color. I see the world in white, and I'm walking. Have you ever seen the one in the air a second life? Have you come out of the water with the old one left behind? If you have so to say, I see the world in life, I see the world in white. I see the world in gospel, I see the world you 
Oh, your mercy never fails me On bad days I've been held in your hand From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of a goodness of God as we pray this morning. God, we thank you so much for, for all the ways, all the many ways you show yourself to us and your goodness. And help us uh, uh, so many times, help us to get out of our own way and open our eyes to what you are and what you have for us and the ways that you bless us that we don't realize that we take for granted. Uh, especially this weekend, uh, we take for granted the, the country that we live in that's free and that we can worship here uh, we can talk about you. We can sing to you uh, with no fear of, of any uh, repercussion for that. We're free to do that and help us to just understand what that means and help us to love you as a result. That you put us here and we're blessed. And because you blessed us, uh, we want to give to you in return. Those of us who call the Avenue home, we want to take these next few moments to, to give our tithes and our offerings resources to you uh, you've done everything for us uh, so we'll give to you in return pray this in your name
Appreciate you being here. Those in Ennis, thank you for taking a break from the Polka Festival. Uh, those of you online watching from the lake, we hope you get a sunburn. Uh, no, we're glad you joined us wherever you are. We are in the second week of a series we're calling Blessed. And we're talking about how to live a life that is blessed by God. If you weren't with us last week, one of the things we talked about is we use the word blessed in a lot of different ways that, that are not biblical. And so we want to understand the biblical definition of blessed. And blessed is not about having a nice house and having a nice car or, or getting a raise. It's not about material possessions. Blessed is about putting yourself in a position where God can give you favor. Putting yourself in a position that God can do something in your life and add something to your life. When we live in disobedience to God and we're not following his principles, he, we cannot be in his favor. And so being blessed is, is about becoming holy. It's about becoming more like him. It's about reading his word and understanding it and applying the principles to our life. We talked last week about an Old Testament principle, and I want you to understand that we are not under the Old Testament law. Uh, the Old Testament was written, if you do this, then I'll do this. The New Testament is because Jesus did this, we have access to God. It's a completely different covenant, but it's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. And so there are principles that he uses to help us understand who he is. And those principles fit throughout eternity. And the principle we talked about last week was called the principle of first. And what that is, is God wants to know us to know that we trust him. God wants us to place our trust in him, to believe that he has our best interest, to believe he's going to take care of our needs. And so what he asks for is before you have anything else, I want the first. I want the first of everything in your life. And for us, because our system is set up in the financial world, money is a great test of that. If we can give God that first tenth, that first fruit, and then trust him with the rest, he knows that we are trusting him, and it puts him in a position, puts us in a position that he could show us favor. And so we went through all of that, and we understand that. And any time we talk about trusting God, money comes up in the conversation. In fact, Jesus talked more about money than he did about the kingdom of heaven. He talked more about money than he talked about prayer uh, in 35 of his parables. And parables is a fancy word for teaching, for story. 
When Jesus told stories, he was always trying to explain to the crowd the kingdom of God. And out of 35 of those, 16 stories revolved around money. And so he uses money all the way through to show us a little bit about the kingdom of God and what the kingdom of God is like. And so it may surprise you because of the way preachers talk, Jesus never asked for money. When you read through the scripture, you'll never find a time that he asked for money. Now, his ministry was supported by his followers, but he never asked for money. It's never recorded. The only time he asked is he asked a guy for a coin one time to show an illustration, and we presume he gave the coin back to the guy. Uh, And and so he never asked for money. But he talks about money because it's an indicator of our heart. Now, a lot of people start thinking, you know, money is the root of all evil. That is not correct. That is not in the Bible. Money is not the root of all evil. Money is not evil in itself. In fact, money's good. I mean, when you go to pay your bills, it's nice to have it, right? You sleep better when your bills are paid. Am I right? You sleep better when there's money in the bank. Money is not a bad thing. It says the love of money is the root of evil. If you have money in the wrong perspective in your life, that's the root of evil. If you're a lover of money more than you're a lover of God, that's why the verse we mentioned last week, and it's in this week too, is you cannot serve both God and money. If you try to serve both, you're going to love one and hate the other or or despise one and desire the other. And we see that. And so what we're trying to do, Jesus is trying to get us to put money in perspective. Now, money can add meaning to our life but it can't be the meaning of life. Money is a means to an end. It's not an end in itself. Now, many of you are living your life as money is a means, is the means. Money is the end. Money is the most important thing. Out, out of 30 years of doing ministry, all the funerals I've done, never once have I listed a person's assets at their funeral. Never once has I've gone, he leaves behind a bass boat. He leaves behind a hunting lease. He leaves behind you know $30,000 in the bank. None, never have I done that. In fact, there's no mention of how much money a person accumulates unless, of course, he gave it away. If he gave it away, his life stood for something. He used money as a means to an end. But if you live your life and money is the end result, you end up living a very shallow, meaningless life. When this world is over for you and all you have to show for it is financial gain, you've lost everything and gained nothing. And so Jesus is trying to say through this story we're going to read today, he's trying to say, hey, this is how you use money. Last week we talked about it's a test, and it is. Money's a test. You get money each week, you give that first to God, that's a test, do you trust me? But the other 90%, do you know he's interested in that too? The other 90%, it's not like, okay, go do what you want now. He's like, hey, I want you to use money, and I want you to leverage it. I want you to use it. For good. I want you to use it as a means to an end. And so Jesus tells a story here, and he's pointing out how we should use money in this world during our limited time here and our limited opportunity. Now, remember, Jesus is an incredible storyteller, and people are following him, and people are hanging on his every word, and he has all stations of life sitting out there listening. He has the poor, Undervantaged people, 50% of the population of Israel were basically slaves because they were so poor that they just barely got by. They lived day to day, hand to mouth, trying to take care of their family. And he also had the rich people that would gather and listen to him speak. And the rich people listened to his words. And they were the ones that had everything. And they had all of the material possessions they needed. And then the religious people would listen to him. And so they'd sit in groups and Jesus would, would tell these stories. And every story he told... One character in the story represented God, and the other character represented man. And he's trying to explain the kingdom, and so we get to this passage, and if you read it through, the first time you read it through, you're like, did that just happen? Did Jesus just say that? That's that's really weird. And you're going to see why he's telling it, and you need to understand the background. He's explaining God and us, and he's using a rich man and a supervisor. He's using a manager. And so it starts, he's telling his disciples, and everybody's listening. There was a rich man. This is not a true story. It's a story made up to make a point. There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management because you cannot be my manager any longer. So we got a guy who's very, very wealthy. In fact, he's so rich, he hires a guy to manage his finances for him because he just has so much of it. In this culture, remember, a rich man is like the banker. 
He is, owns the bank. He is the bank. People come to him for loans. People come to him for help. He charges them interest. He makes money off of them. And so he has this guy managing. Well, he hears that this manager is not doing a very good job. He's wasting money and he's not doing uh, the things he want, needs him to do. So he calls him in and says, hey, you're about to be terminated. You're about to, I'm about to let you go. So go get the books in order. Get them all together. Bring them to me. We're going to fire you. Now, the manager has a crisis And I love what the manager says because he's so honest. Manager says to himself, what shall I do now? He knows that he has this limited time till he gets the books in order. He has a very limited time. He has a very limited opportunity. He says, my master's taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm ashamed to beg. So, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't want to work in labor. I'm not doing construction. I don't want to stand on the corner with a 7-Eleven cup and ask for change. What am I going to do? <clears throat> I don't want to do either one of those things. And he gets a thought. He comes up with a plan. He goes, ah, I got it. I know what I'll do. And when I lose, I know what I do when I lose my job here. People will welcome me into their homes. And so he thinks, okay, this is what I can do. He finds himself with limited opportunity, limited time, but he's going to make the best of it. He brings in all of the debtors, all the people that owe his master money. And he sits them down, and Jesus gives us two examples. He says, he goes to the first one, and he says, how much do you owe my master? The guy says, I owe him 900 gallons of olive oil. That's a lot of olive oil. What do you do with 900 gallons of olive oil? He owes him 900 gallons of olive oil. The manager says, take your bill, sit down quickly. We don't have a lot of time. Make it out for $450, 450 gallons. In other words, we'll settle up right here. I'll tell you what, we'll cut it in half. The guy's like, whoa, thank you very much. Man, if there's anything I can ever do for you in the future, let me know. The guy's like, yeah, it'll be sooner than you think. I'll be calling on you. He gives him another example. He says, uh, another guy comes in. He says, how much do you owe? He says, I owe him 1,000 bushels of wheat. He says, okay, take your bill and make it 800. Man, that's so generous. Thank you. He's generous. It's not his money, right? It's somebody else's money. So he's generous. He's like, hey, cut it down to this and and we'll settle up. And so he does it with all of these debtors. And so he knows now that he's earned all this favor, that when his master fires him, he can show up at anybody's house and go, hey, man, remember when I cut your bill in half? Could I, you know, maybe spend the night, have something to eat? He's set. He's used all this, you know, he's used all this uh, wealth, somebody else's wealth to earn favor. Now, When this story is going on, remember, we have all these different people listening. The poor people are sitting out here going, yeah, stick it to him. Stick it to that rich guy. The rich people are out here going, that guy needs to get caught. I hope that guy goes to jail, that dirty, rotten scoundrel. You know, I I hope the lesson is that, you know, can't be dishonest or or it's going to be found out. So they're all listening, waiting for Jesus. What's Jesus going to say next? And they all lean in and, and Jesus says something that in... For us, it's very confusing because we have this dishonest manager. He's got this guy that's using somebody else's money to earn favor, and he says, the master commended him. In other words, the master brought him in and said, huh, good job. That was very shrewd. That was quick thinking. You should have used some of that skill when you were my manager. That is, that's the kind of thinking I want, somebody that thinks outside the box. And then that's confusing when we read that because Jesus seems to be commending somebody for being dishonest. But remember, one of the people represent God. The other person represents us. So he's saying God is the rich one. We are the managers. He goes and he says it this way. He says, I tell you, the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of the light. He says, listen, this man, these people in the world, they understand money better than you do. They understand that they can use this money to incur favor. They understand that they can use this money to create friendships and set themselves up. People of the light, followers, Christians, you need to understand that you need to use money in a positive way to gain influence. You need to use money as a way to gather friends, as a way to do things that will open up the doors for you. He goes, man, you need to understand worldly wealth. You need to use worldly 
wealth. The lesson is we have a limited amount of time and a limited opportunity, and we need to use the master's resources to the best of our ability to open the door. To open the door, to do things, to be known for generosity. As a church, we need to be known for generosity because that opens the door. When you do things for your community and you pour out things in your community, when you provide a splash pad and a park and all of these things and you open up to the community, you're showing generosity. You're using resources to make friends. But you're trying to make friends for eternal benefit. You're trying to make friends for eternal benefit. He says, listen, I tell you, This is just for Christians. I'll tell you, use worldly wealth because there's another kind of wealth. There's treasures that we store up in heaven that moth and rust cannot destroy. He says, use this worldly wealth and use it to gain friends so that when it's gone, because it will be gone one day and you'll be gone one day, when everything's gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. With our limited time and opportunity, we are to use 100% of the money God gives us to leverage it in a way that has eternal blessing. Now, can you see this? So if we're living our life for ourselves, if we're living our life for our selfish desires, if we're not using our finances, all of it, to leverage it for good, then we're living a shallow, wasteful life. Our God is money, and there's nothing in the end. But if we use our money as a means... For eternal dwellings. Here's a great example. The people that have given to provide this building that we're in each and every week. What a wonderful story. You get to come here. This is a cool building. It's a beautiful building. We have great space for children. We have, like I said, the park area. Over in Ennis, you have a beautiful building coming up. That's going to be a place that everybody in town is going to want to visit and be a part of. All of you that contributed to that, you leveraged your money for eternal good. So instead of getting stuff with your money, you get stories. Instead of getting stuff that you accumulate, you have stories of eternal life. You you get to be part of the greatest story ever. Every child that comes into this building and accepts Jesus into their heart, you're part of their story. Every family that comes through re-engage and puts their life back together and has a strong, healthy home You're part of that story. Every addict who comes in fighting addiction on Monday night and gets their life back in order and becomes a productive member of society, you are part of that story. And so when you get into your eternal reward, there are people that will be thanking you for having Celebrate Recovery in your church. There'll be people that are thanking you for re-engage. There'll be people thanking you for supporting youth ministry. People thanking you for providing a place that they could come and hear the story of Jesus. And wouldn't you rather have eternal stories than stuff? That's what he's talking about. That's what he's looking for. And Jesus is making the example, hey, be shrewd with your money like this manager. Use it for eternal gain. Use it for something more than yourself. Because if you let your selfish desires eat it up at the end, it's just stuff. There's nothing left. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. I know where you are right now. You're all sitting out there for a majority of you are thinking this. Yeah, if I just had more, I would do that. That sounds wonderful. I would love to give if I just had more. God, let me win the lottery. I'll give 50% to people. If you just give me more, God, I just don't have enough. I just barely have enough for me, God. And I'd love to be generous. And if I just had more, I'd be generous. Jesus knew you were going to say it too. Because people haven't changed. And so he looks at the crowd and he realized what they're all thinking. They're all thinking, nah, I just don't have enough. The poorest person's thinking that, the richest person's thinking that. And so Jesus goes, hey, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. But whoever's dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. He says, no, no, no. I know what you're thinking. You don't need more. How, why would I give you more? If you're not faithful with a little, why would I do more? If you're not faithful with a little, if you're not generous with a little bit, you're not going to be generous with a lot. If you're not giving with a little, you're not going to give with a lot. If you're not faithful with a little, you're not going to be faithful with a lot. And so that's where most of you find yourself staying, always needing more because there's never enough. I told you 30 years ago what you'd be making today. You think you'd be rich, but you're not. 
because you eat it up. We devour it. We use it for selfish ambition. We use it for our own things. We accumulate and we don't use it for the kingdom of God and for his glory. And so it is just wasted on us. He says, if you're faithful with a little, I have people in my office sometimes and they tell me, pastor, I just make too much money. 10% is a huge amount to give to the church. And I'm always like, well, my prayer for you is to make a little enough that you can give then. I'm going to ask God to cut your pay down so you can afford to tithe. I think that's a great idea. You make too much to give. If you're faithful in a little, he goes on and says, hey, if you're not trustworthy handling worldly wealth, because there's a greater wealth. If you're not trustworthy handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you haven't been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? See, he's back to this. Now, this is just for Christians. If you believe that God created the world and everything in it and it belongs to him, you're just a manager. You don't own anything. And the minute you think you own something, guess what? It owns you. And some of you know that, right? Your car, two cars in your house own you. That farm, that ranch, it owns you. That boat, it owns you. That travel trailer, it owns you. It owns you. You don't own it. Listen, you're going to leave everything behind, everything except what you store up in heaven. He says this, if you're wise, you'll handle your opportunity and you'll handle your resources and you'll do it in a way that there's eternal reward, not earthly reward, because this doesn't matter. You'd be smart about it and you're going to use it to do something incredible. And so here's my question. What do you want to be thanked for today? If people were going to line up today and thank you for something, what do you want them to thank you for? This is Memorial Weekend, right? We're remembering men and women who sacrificed their futures, who sacrificed their life. These are children that are going to grow up without a mom or dad because this person made the ultimate sacrifice for something they believed in. They believed in the United States of America. They believed in our freedom. They believed in our way of life. And they gave their life so that we could live. And this is our thank you to them. But the question comes, what do you want to be thanked for? What have you invested your life in? Do you really want the end of your life to be nothing but accumulation of junk? Do you want the end of your life to just be that you consumed? Do you want the end of your life to be filled with your kids going through your closet talking about how fashion forward you were? Do you want the end of your life to be about they always got the latest upgrade? Do you want the end of your life to be a house full of stuff that your kids just have to go through and get rid of? Or do you want your life to amount to something? So what is it today in your life that's worthy of your resources? What do you want to be known for? What do you want to be remembered for? Because if you don't answer these questions, you're just going to eat it up. Your selfish desire is going to eat up all of your resources in this limited time, and you're going to have nothing of eternity to show for it. You want to have a blessed life? God doesn't want just 10%. He wants 100% of your money to be leveraged. Now, folks, remember, money's not evil. The love of money is. God doesn't mind you going on a great vacation with your family. God doesn't mind you having nice things. God doesn't mind. He's, he's your father. He loves it when his children enjoy life. Money is made to enjoy life. Nothing wrong with that. Unless that becomes the end. Money can add meaning to your life, but it is not the meaning of life. Find out what the meaning of life is. Stand for something. Make your life worthy of a life well lived. When we stand at your funeral, let's thank you for something besides just buying a bunch of junk. Live your life in a way that's worthy. Then he goes into this passage, no one can serve two masters. You're going to serve God, you're going to serve money. I love verse 14. The Pharisees who loved money, <clears throat> the Pharisees who loved money, and there's some of you in the room, 
and you're sneering at me just like they were sneering at him. Oh, that preacher just wants more money for that church. The Pharisees who love money heard all this and were sneering at Jesus. You know who those Pharisees' names were? Me neither. Because nobody cares. They live a life that amounted to nothing. You want your life to count? You want your life to mean something? Use money not as just a test, but use it as a tool and leverage it for the kingdom of God. Would you bow with me? God, I pray that you will help us live for something bigger than ourselves. God, I pray that you will use our limited time and our limited resources for eternal things. Father God, help us to leverage all the resources you give us for your glory, for your honor. Thank you, God, for what you've provided. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It's been a great weekend here at the Avenue with you. So glad that you could be a part. Hope to see you next week for part three of Blessed. If you would like the companion book uh, for some summer reading, we have the Blessed Life book available in the Hub, and we're actually beating Amazon's price. It's $10 in the Hub. It's $12 on Amazon. So come see us in the Hub. Hope you have a great weekend, rest of your weekend. Stay safe. Hope to see you next week. Take care. Bye. If you have any questions or need prayer, send us a message at info at theavenuechurch.com. We are always here for you. Looking for ways to give from where you are? Text the amount to 84321. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us on social media to stay in the loop. Thank you so much for joining us today, and we'll see you next week.